Hello, this is Miss Natalie, and I'm going to be reading uh, Matilda, Chapter 10. If you would like to listen to an earlier chapter, if you'd like to listen to Chapter 1, uh, if you are have listened to 1, 2, and 3 and want to listen to 4 and 5, go to the description box, which is below this video, and there's a box, um, and you can press on... I believe the different chapters. If you can't click the chapters, what you can do is copy them and paste them into the um, bar above where you type in uh, the websites you want to go to. If that doesn't work, if it's hard for you to copy and paste, go to the Bridges um, YouTube channel and uh, click on videos and scroll through all the videos and they should be in there. Okay, chapter 10, Throwing the Hammer. The nice thing about Matilda was that if you had met her casually and talked to her, you would have thought she was a perfectly normal five-and-a-half-year-old child. She displayed almost no outward signs of her brilliance, and she never showed off. This is a very sensible and quiet little girl, you would have said to yourself, and unless... For some reason, you had started a discussion with her about literature or mathematics. You would have never known the extent of her brain power. It was therefore easy for Matilda to make friends with other children. All those in her class liked her. They knew, of course, that she was clever because they had heard her being questioned by Miss Honey on the first day of term. And they knew also that she was allowed to sit quietly with a book during lessons and not pay attention to the teacher. But children of their age do not search deeply for reasons. They are far too wrapped up in their own small struggles to worry over much about others, what others are doing and why. Among Matilda's new friends was the girl called Lavender. Right from the first day of term, the two of them started wandering around together during the morning break and in the lunch hour. I think morning break and, and lunch hour are um, recess and lunch recess. Lavender was exceptionally small for her age. A skinny little nymph with deep brown eyes and with dark hair that was cut in a fringe across her forehead. A nymph is like a another word for like a fairy. Matilda liked her because she was gusty and adventurous. She liked Matilda for exactly the same reasons. Before the first week of term was up, awesome tales about the headmistress, Miss Trenchbull, began to filter through to the newcomers. Matilda and Lavender, standing in a corner of the playground during morning break, on the third day, were approached by a rugged ten-year-old with a boil on her nose called Hortensia. No scum, I suppose, Hortensia said to them, looking down from her great height. She was eating from an extra large bag of potato chips and digging the stuff out in handfuls. Welcome to Borstall, she added, spraying bits of chips out of her mouth like snowflakes. The two tiny ones, confronted by the giant, kept a, uh, kept a watchful silence. Have you met the trench bowl yet? Hortensia asked. We've seen her at prayers, Lavender said, but we haven't met her. You've got a treat coming to you, Hortensia said. She hates very small children. She therefore loathes the bottom class and everyone in it. She thinks five-year-olds are grubs and haven't yet hatched out. In went another fistful of chips, and when she spoke again, out spread the crumbs. If you survive your first year, you may just manage to live through the rest of your time here. But many don't survive. They get carried out on stretchers, screaming. I've seen it often. Hortensia paused to observe the effect these remarks were having on the two titchy ones. Not very much. They seemed pretty cool. So the large one decided to regale them with further information. I suppose you know the trench bowl has a lock, uh, a lock up cupboard in her private quarters called the Chokey. Have you heard about the Chokey? 
Matilda and Lavender shook their heads and continued to gaze up at the giant. Being very small, they were inclined to mistrust any creature that was larger than they were, especially senior girls. The Choki, Hortensia went on, is a very tall but very narrow cupboard. The floor is only ten inches square, so you can't sit down or squat in it. You have to stand, and three of the walls are made of cement with bits of broken glass sticking out all over, so you can't lean against them. You have to stand more or less at attention all the time when you get locked up in there. It's terrible. Can't you lean against the door? Matilda asked. Don't be daft, Hortensia said. The door's got a thousand sharp spiky nails sticking out of it. They've been hammered through from the outside, probably by the trunch bull herself. Have you ever be been in there? Lavender a asked. My ter first term I was in there six times, Hortensia said. Twice for a whole day and the other times for two hours each. But two hours is quite as bad enough. It's pitch dark and you have to stand up dead straight. And if you wobble at all, you get spiked either by the glass on the walls or the nails on the door. Why were you put in? Matilda asked. What had you done? The first time, Hortensia said, I poured half a tin of golden syrup on the seat of the chair the trunch bowl was going to sit on at prayers. It was wonderful. When she lowered herself into the chair, there was a loud squelching noise. Someone similar to the, made by hippopotamus when lowering its foot into the mud on the banks of the Lipopo River. But you're too small and too stupid to have read the just-so stories, aren't you? I've read them, Matilda said. So the hippopotamus and the Lipopo River are from the just-so stories. I have not read them. Um... And I was going to say something else, but I don't remember. So let's keep going. You're a liar, Hortensia said amiably. You can't even read yet, but no matter. So when the trench bull sat down on the golden syrup, the squelch was beautiful. And then she jumped up again and the chair sort of stuck to the seat of those awful green breeches she wears and came up with her for a few seconds until the thick syrup slowly came unstuck. Then she clasped her hands to the seat of her breeches and both hands got covered in muck. You should have heard her bellow. So remember, breeches are pants. In uh, uh, London English, uh, pants means underwear. <laughs> so they say... Uh, breeches as in pants but how but how did she know it was you lavender asked a little squirt called ollie bog's whistle sneaked snitched sneaked on me i think that means snitching hortensia said i knocked his front teeth out and the trench will put you in the chokey for a whole day matilda asked gump, gulping all day long hortensia said I was off me rocker when she let me out. I was babbling like an idiot. What were the other things you did to get put in the chokey? Lavender asked. Ah, oh, I can't remember them all now, Hortensia said. She spoke with an air of an old warrior who has been in so many battles that bravely has become commonplace. That bravery has become commonplace. It's all so long ago. She added, stuffing more chips in her mouth. Ah, yes, I remember one. Here's what happened. I chose a time when I knew the trench bowl was out of the way teaching the sixth formers, and I put up my hand and asked to go to the bogs. But instead of going there, I sneaked into the trench bowl's room, and after a speedy search, I found the drawer where she kept her gym knickers again. Knickers are also uh, a word for um, underpants. Go on, Matilda said spellbound. What happened next? I had sent away 
by post, you see, for this very powerful itching powder, Hortensia said. It cost 50p a packet and was called the skin scorcher. 50p means 50 pence and pence is like um, cents. The label said it was made from the powdered teeth of deadly snakes and it was guaranteed to raise welts the size of walnuts on your skin. So I sprinkled the stuff inside every pair of knickers in the drawer and then folded them up again carefully. Hortensia paused to cram more chips in her mouth. Did it work? Lavender asked. Well, Hortensia said, a few days later during prayers, the trench bowl suddenly started scratching herself like mad down below. Aha! Aha! I said to myself, here we go. She's changed for Jim already. It was pretty wonderful to be sitting there watching it all and knowing that I was the only person in the whole room who realized exactly what was going on inside the Trunchbull's pants. And I felt safe too. I knew I couldn't be caught. Then the scratching got worse. She couldn't stop. She must have thought she had a wasp nest down there. And then right in the middle of Lord's Prayer, she leapt up and grabbed her bottom and rushed out of the room. Ah, I remember what I was going to say. So, um, some schools have a, a church service during school. Um, usually, uh, schools that, um, where everybody at the school, um, has, um, the same religion. Uh, they'll have a church service during school. We, a lot of schools in the United States don't do that um, because a lot of students come from a lot of different places. Uh, but if you go to like a specifically Catholic school in the United States, usually public schools are not like this, but private, private schools, a private Catholic school, um, you'll have a prayer class and you'll have to uh, go to, they usually have a um, small church uh, on campus and you'll go to uh, and have a service during the school day. Both Matilda and Lavender were enthralled. It was quite clear to them that they were at this moment standing in the presence of a master. Here was somebody who had brought the art of sc skull duggery to the highest point of perfection. Somebody, moreover, who is willing to risk life and limb in the pursuit of her calling. They gazed in wonder at this goddess, and suddenly even the boil on her nose was no longer a blemish, but a badge of courage. Uh, when they mean boil, um, they, they mean a, a pimple. She's got a really big pimple on her nose. But how did she catch you that time? Lavender asked, breathless in wonder. She didn't, Hortensia said. But I got a day in the chokey just the same. Why? they both asked. The trunch bull, Hortensia said, has a nasty habit of guessing. When she doesn't know who the culprit is, she makes a guess at it. And the trouble is, she's often right. I was the prime suspect this time because of the golden syrup job. And although I know knew she didn't have any proof. Nothing I said made any difference. I kept shouting, How could I have done it, Miss Trunchbull? I didn't even know you kept any spare knickers in the school. I don't even know what itching powder is. I've never heard of it. But the lying didn't help me in spite of the great performance I put on. The Trunchbull simply grabbed me by one ear and rushed me in to the chokey at the... Uh, at the double and threw me inside and locked the door. That was my second all-day stretch. It was absolute torture. I was spiked and cut all over when I came out. It's like a war, Matilda said, overawed. You're darn right it is like a war, Hortensia cried. And the casualties are terrific. We are the cas crusaders. 
The gallant army fighting for our lives with hardly any weapons at all. And the trench bull is the prince of darkness, the foul serpent, the fiery dragon with all the weapons at her command. It's a tough life. We all try to support each other. You can rely on us, Lavender said, making her height of three feet two inches stretch as tall as possible. No, I can't, Hortensia said. You're only shrimps. But you never know. We might find a use for you one day in some undercover job. Tell us just a little bit more about what she does, Matilda said. Please do. I mustn't frighten you before you've been here a week, Hortensia said. You won't, Lavender said. We may be small, but we're quite tough. Listen to this then, Hortensia said. Only yesterday the trench bull caught a boy called Julius Rotwinkle eating licorice all sorts during the scripture lesson and she simply picked him up by one arm and flung him clear out the open classroom window. Our classroom is on the floor up and we saw Julius Rotwinkle go sailing out over the garden like a frisbee and landing with a thump in the middle of the lettuce when the trench bull turned to us and said, from now on, everyone caught eating in the class goes straight out the window. Did this Julius Rotwinkle break any bones? Lavender asked. Only a few, Hortensia said. You've got to remember that the trans trench bull once threw the hammer for the Briton in the Olympics, so she's very proud of her right arm. What's throwing the hammer? L Lavender asked. The hammer, Hortensia said. It's actually a ruddy great cannonball on the end of a long bit of wire, and the thrower whisks it around and around, his or her head faster and faster, and then lets it go. You have to be terrifically strong. The trench bull will throw anything around just to keep her arm in, especially children. Good heavens, Lavender said. I once heard her say, Hortensia went on, that a large boy is about the same weight as an Olympic hammer and therefore he's very useful for practicing with. At that point, something strange happened. The playground, which up to then had been filled with shrieks and the shouts of children at play, all at once became silent as the grave. Watch out, Hortensia whispered. Matilda and Lavender glanced around and saw a gigantic figure of Miss Trenchball advancing through the crowd of boys and girls with menacing strides. The children threw back, drew back hastily to let her through, and her progress across the asphalt was like that of Moses going through the Red Sea when the waters parted. A formidable figure she was too. In her belted smock and green breeches, below the knees, her calf muscles stood out like grapefruits, grapefruits inside her stockings. Amanda Thrip, she shouted. You, Amanda Thrip, come here. Hold your hats, Hortensia whispered. What's going to happen? Lavender whispered back. That idiot's Amanda, Hortensia said. Just let her long hair grow long, even longer. She has let her long hair grow even longer during the holidays, and her mother has braided it into pigtails. Silly thing to do. It says plaited, but I said braided because that's what it means. Plaited means braided. Why silly? Matilda asked. If there's one thing the trench bull can't stand, it's pigtails, Hortensia said. Matilda and Lavender saw the giant in green breeches advancing upon the girl of about ten who had a pair of pl uh, plaited golden pigtails hanging over her shoulders. Each pigtail had a blue satin bow at the end of it, and it looked very pretty. The girl wearing the pigtails, Amanda Thrip, stood quite still watching the advancing giant, and the expression on her face was one that you might find on the face of a person who is trapped in a small field with an, with an enraged bull which was charging flat out towards her. The girl was glued to the spot, terror-struck, pop-eyed, quivering, knowing that for certain that the day of judgment had come for her at last. Miss Trenchbull had 
now reached the victim and stood towering over her. I want those filthy pigtails off before you come back to school tomorrow, she barked. Chop him off and throw him in the dustbin, you understand? Amanda, paralyzed with fright, managed to stutter. M my m m mommy likes them. She plats them for me every morning. Your mommy's a twit, the trench bowl bellowed. She pointed a finger the size of salami at the children's head and shouted, You look like a rat with a tail coming out of its head. My, my m mommy thinks I look very lovely, Mr. Tr Trunchbull. Amanda stuttered, shaking like a... I have no idea what that word is. Blank... Mange? Blank mange? Hmm. If you don't know a word, you can always put it into uh, Google. I'll probably look that up later. I don't give a tinker's toot what your mommy thinks, the trench bull yelled. And with that, she lunged forward and grabbed hold of Amanda's pigtails in her right fist and lifted her clear off the ground. Then she started swinging her around and around her head, faster and faster, and Amanda was screaming, blue murder, and the trench bull was yelling, I'll give you pigtails, you little rat! Shades of the Olympics, Hortensia murmured. She's getting up speed now. Just look like she does with the hammer. Ten to one, she's going to throw her. And now the trench bowl was leaning back against the weight and whirling the girl and pivoting expertly on her toes, spinning around and around. As soon as Amanda Thripp was traveling so fast, she became a blur. And suddenly, with a mighty grunt, the trench bowl let go of the pigtails and Amanda went sailing like a rocket over the wire fence of the playground and high into the sky. Well thrown, sir! Someone shouted from across the playground. And Matilda, who was mesmerized by the whole crazy affair, saw Amanda Thripp descending in a long, graceful parabola on to the playing field beyond. She landed on the grass and bounced three times and finally came to, the re to a rest. Then, amazingly, she sat up. She looked a trifle dazed, and who could blame her? But after a minute or so, she was on her feet again and trotted back towards the playground. The trench bowl stood on the playground, dusting off her hands. Not bad, she said, considering I'm not in strict training. Not bad at all. Then she strode away. She's mad, Hortensia said. But don't the parents complain? Matilda asked. Would yours? Hortensia said. I know my wouldn't. mine wouldn't. She treats the mothers and fathers just the same as the children, and they're all too scared. They're all scared to death of her. I'll be seeing you sometime, you two. And with that, she sauntered away. Oof. Let's look at that word. Blanc mange. Oh. I think maybe that's French. Let's look it up. I'm going to look it up on the computer. Uh, it's going to take a little bit. It's a little bit so. Okay. Blanc mange. Oh, blemange. Ah, she was shaking like blemange. Blemange is a uh, French, okay, it's a, it's a sweet dessert commonly made with milk or cream and sugar thick, thickened with gelatin, cornstarch, or Irish moss, and often flavored with almonds. It's usually set in a mold and served cold, although traditionally white blemanges are frequently given alternative colors. So it's kind of like um, she was uh, shaking like jello. That's, that's what a blancmange is. And so she was sitting there going <laughs> and shaking. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that chapter. I will read the next one later. And again, if you haven't listened to the 
previous chapters, go ahead and find them in the description below.